So, hi everybody. My name is Wilson Santos, and my presentation today is going to be all about what is violence. So, one of the first things I want everybody in this class to do is close your eyes. All right. I'm going to tell you a situation which probably none of you have actually ever been in. So, imagine yourself in a group of thousands of people around you. Everyone around you is yelling at the top of their lungs. All of a sudden, a fight, break, a fight breaks out to your left. As you look up, you hear police sirens racing past you down the street as you make your way to the front of the crowd. But people begin to push you since they also want to head to the center of the action. You see people holding up signs with their angered words scribbled all over them. Then a gun is shot into the air. People begin to scramble all over the place, and before you know it, you're pinned down to the ground with a policeman handcuffed. And now everybody, open your eyes. What you imagine would probably be what a typical riot would be at any place in the world at any point in history. And the reason that I chose everybody to do it is because I want to see that everybody knows that violence is one of the things that shouldn't be done, and that it should be something that's only used for change in the world. So this is what we believe violence is. People, not all of them, believe that violence should be used whenever they want, not because it's a necessary tool. Back in, the, back in history, people used violence as a way to get their point across and make sure that what they said was for good of the people and not just for themselves. And right now, violence is just used because they want to they could just start a fight anywhere because they want to get their anger out or whatever. And there's no point in it whatsoever. An example of this would be something that happened to an advisor of mine. Uh, he's not here anymore, but when he was, he had ex his life was very violent because he was always angered, and that would be what in his video. Like, I just want to say, like, what violence is to me. I used to be a very, like, naive kid. Like thinking the world was like all happy and joyful, but it's not, you know? Freshman year, I got jumped by like eight kids. Like all I was trying to do was just open the car door for them in order for all of them to pass and then bam, someone decides to take my phone. I could have easily just let it happen. And I so what happens after the video, since I couldn't show all of it, was basically uh, my advisee, after he had got his phone taken away, he got very violent and he started attacking the people that had taken his phone away. As a result, a couple of them went to the hospital and uh, he was, I think he was either arrested or taken uh, to his house because of the violent actions that he took. And the reason that uh, I wanted to show this video is because there are many groups out here in the world that are actually trying to fight against violence. And one of the groups is done is with my other advisee, Sam Yazon working with a bunch of people to make known the violence that is in our world today and that people who are quiet about it sometimes are the ones that have the most stories to tell. So how I know that violence has changed over the years? I'm going to tell you about three different situations in which violence has changed over the course of time. Everybody here knows about Al Capone. Chicago made sir during the Prohibition era and Al Capone was a very vicious man. He led violence in the streets of Chicago for a very long time and he became filthy rich when he started selling illegal liquor. And because of that, he was on the wanted list for a long time. Howard Al Capone was working alongside the people of America. During that time, uh, the 18th Amendment had been passed, which led, led to the prohibition of selling of alcohol in the United States. And that angered thousands and thousands of people throughout the world. And because of this, many fights, many riots, many uh, confrontations with the police let out, especially when liquor was uh, involved. And Al Capone used this as an advantage to uh, make the use of violence uh, work against, work with him. And after him and after so many years of fighting against it, the 21st Amendment had been passed. The 21st Amendment was basically the abolishment of the 18th Amendment, the first time it happened ever in the US history in which 
alcohol had is now is legal to sell, but now has been with many restrictions on. <coughs> And that is what violence was back in the day. Violence was so that they could get their point across. People had a way to show their voice and show that what they cared about will be heard no matter what kind of means or whatever it takes. Nowadays, violence is pretty pointless. To be honest, it's pretty dumb because violence is done at any point and at a time. One of these examples is bullying. Bullying is probably one of the um, leading causes to suicidal teens. And I know many people here have been either bullied or been the bully. I myself have been both, and it's not the most funnest thing to do. And when it comes to bullying, there's no really point in doing it. It's just for self-pleasure and for wanting to make yourself look cool, especially when you're younger, because you don't want to be the one kid who sits on the side and just stay there and be the one who's going to get bullied next. You want to be take the action or be the one who causes it. And my last example for Rhino City would be my interview with the retired cop named David Haynes. <clears throat> David Haynes. David Haynes had worked in Cabrini, one of a very one of a very more, a very dangerous place in Chicago for a long time. During that time, whenever he had to go and work and walk around Cabrini, he needed four squad cars with him. And he needed a SWAT vehicle to follow him behind for backup at any point. And he had told me that reason Cabrini was so bad is because at any point anybody could just start a problem. Police were frightened to go back. That's why back then the police had to be one of the probably the toughest people of Chicago. There were requirements sent to the police at that time. You had to be a certain height, certain weight, certain body mass, all of that. And now Chicago police are really, could be anybody, could be the biggest person you know, eating donuts on the side or something like that. <laughs> just, and what are they going to do when somebody's starting a gunfight? Somebody, you try to arrest somebody and they start off, there's no way they're going to catch up to them. They're probably going to topple over and roll over on the floor or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying that violence now is done whatever and there's no way of stopping it. And it's become such an issue that most people tend to ignore it. Whenever somebody sees something happening on the alley or something like that, they tend to walk away instead of trying to act against it. And I understand that you want to walk away because if you start getting involved, you don't, who knows, you could be the one ending up in the hospital or you could be the one, the next person dying on the floor. But if you take the right measures against it, it's mostly something that will help everybody else. There's one organization that came here back, I think, two years ago, and the organization was, I think, named Cure Violence. I think we all saw that movie where about those people walked around with that dude who was, where they go went to meet that dude at the house who was like really scared and when he saw the police he started ducking down. Yeah, you remember that. Um, him, that organization is a perfect example of people trying to stop violence in Chicago. Instead of uh, stopping it with, with more violence or stopping it with actions, they start talking to the people and the only reason they were good because they get themselves involved in the community so much. And the people deem they talk to them in a way that makes them look like little kids. They make them realize that what they're doing is pretty stupid, that what they're doing is not something they should be doing. They should talk it out instead of doing everything else that everybody wants them to do. And when that happens, people realize that, oh, wait, what am I doing? Like, I could end up hurting somebody or something like that. So my solution to violence would be stopping it, and it would be as simple as that, but it isn't. And that's because nobody actually acts against it. Our generation has gone to the point where we only want to deal with ourselves and not deal with other people. And even though you say, oh, they're my best friends, I got their back, when it truly comes to it, you might not want to get their back when you know that you're going to get hurt really bad, really, you know, very violent way. One way that I propose that we fight violence is that we start with our younger generation. We show them that Violence is something that we should stop and that we have the power to. If our younger generation realizes that we have become a violent people and that they don't want to see that in their future, then they'll start acting, they'll start organizations and all that, and start little, even little clubs in the schools that will make it so that violence will be stopped.